please help me welcome Dr. Nunez. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for coming. I'd like to begin with a, uh, a small story that's going to help put our talk today in a context. I have to tell you before I tell the story uh, that it features one of my alma maters, one of the schools that I graduated from, uh, and that's Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. A lovely school, a very rigorous uh, liberal arts college uh, nestled away in beautiful Madison, New Jersey. If you've never had the opportunity to visit Drew's campus, I invite you to do so. Uh, it's absolutely breathtaking. And it, while it's just 25 minutes away from Jersey City and from the rough and tumble neighborhood that I grew up in Jersey City, it uh, seems to be 100,000 miles away uh, in comparison. It certainly was for me when I stepped on campus. The story I'm going to tell you is going to feature three protagonists, one of which is me. The other two are two students that I met there, students who God in his wisdom made white. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, the interactions that followed um, are in no way representative of the larger student body at Drew University. Uh, the interactions that followed are in no way representative of the, the faculty at Drew University or the staff, and I'm sure the interactions that followed would be vehemently denounced uh, by Drew University, and I need to let you know that at the outset. Now, given that I've given you such a disclaimer, you can imagine that the story that is about to follow is quite the humdinger, and in fact, it is. So my first day at Drew University, back in September of 1992, some of you in the crowd weren't even born in September 1992, uh, but my first day at Drew University, early in September, in the fall, uh, was a gorgeous day. And a day that I had been waiting for for quite some time. It represented the culmination of so many dreams that I had had, so many dreams that my parents had for me. Uh, my parents immigrated from the Dominican Republic over 40 years ago and came to this country with no money, with very little English language skills, and with one social contact. And they settled in the only place that was available to them. They bought a little row house on Duncan Avenue in front of the Lincoln Park and up the street from the notorious Duncan projects that are there no longer. And so being at Drew University represented quite a departure from the background that I was accustomed to. But I have to tell you that owing to the academic training that I had received first at the elementary school that I attended, Public School 39, off of Plainfield Avenue down by Lincoln Park, where I was selected and streamed very early on, uh, in a gifted and talented program and did well in that program, thanks to God and thanks to all of the educators and to my parents at home. And I was able to do well enough to get accepted into a very prestigious high school uh, that typically ranks uh, at the top of Jersey City Public High Schools, and that's academic high school. Today is McNair Academic High School. Uh, quite often ranks in the top three public high schools in the state of New Jersey and quite often ranks in the top 100 public high schools in the state or in the, in the country. So it was a real privilege to attend there. By the time that I graduated academic, uh, now McNair, I was prepared to flourish at the university level. My ability to analyze information critically was very, very good. My ability to write cogently, coherently, logically, incisively was also very good. My ability and confidence in being able to speak up in class and share my thoughts uh, was quite advanced compared to many of my peers. And so in short, I possessed many of the hard skills that are necessary to flourish at the university level. But nothing could prepare me for what I encountered my very first day at Drew University. I had had a set of morning classes that I was very excited to attend. I've always been a lover of education. And again, it was a culmination of my dream. So I sat and just soaked in the environment, walked around this campus that just smelled of privilege and old money. So many of my peers uh, came not just from middle class backgrounds, but from upper middle class backgrounds. This is very important to consider. Many of our colleges and universities around the country are middle class and upper middle class places of learning. 
So as I walked around campus after my classes, I was excited. And I can tell you that the reason that I was excited wasn't so much the classes that I'd just come from uh, or the classes that I had in the afternoon. It was the opportunity to go to lunch. <laughs> lunch at Drew University, dinner at Drew University, breakfast at Drew University was quite an experience for me. It didn't even take place in a cafeteria. A cafeteria would not do justice to the illustrious nature of the place. It was a dining hall, a place of sophistication, high ceilings, floor to window uh, um, uh, mirrors and such, and you could look off into the bucolic forest that surrounded us. It was a place of wonder. What really made it wonderful for me was the unlimited quantities of food available to someone like me. There were gleaming pieces of ham being freshly cut and turkey and brisket and potatoes and something called quiche that I had never heard of before. Now, this may not mean much to you, but I can tell you once again, as the son of immigrants raised in Jersey City, New Jersey, who didn't have much, our food was rationed at home. I couldn't just go into the refrigerator and serve myself as much milk as I wanted to because everyone else needed to drink milk. If we bought a dozen of eggs, we had to make it last, and my mother would make it stretch. And here I was suddenly transported to Drew University in the dining hall where I could serve myself copious and excessive and obscene amount of food and eat it all. And so I did. And as I wended my way through the crowd, I found a table, a community-style long table, and sat down. There were two students sitting there, a male and a female. And they looked just the way that you would expect college students to look. They were dressed properly and preppily. They looked like something out of like an Abercrombie and Fitch meets Gap meets Class sort of advertisement. I looked in their direction and nodded, and they didn't pay attention because they were caught up in their own conversation, which was just fine with me because I was caught up in my own conversation (laughs) with these glistening pieces of meat and potatoes and quiche. And I was so thankful I was sitting there and just reflecting how far I'd come, a kid from Jersey City, the son of immigrants from another nation. Uh, And I was lost in my own thoughts when I happened to notice from the periphery of my vision that the two students were now looking in my direction and they were snickering and pointing. Initially, this wasn't enough to throw me off of this interaction I was having with the glistening pieces of meat and quiche and three glasses of milk. (laughs) But I noticed that my attempts to ignore the students didn't meet with their satisfaction. So they continued attempting to get my attention. They looked over more and snickered more and whispered louder. The type of whisper where you're halfway whispering, but you kind of want people to listen to you. And I thought to myself, I'm from Jersey City. I grew up in a certain place with a certain ethos. And one of the proud principles that we have in my neighborhood in Jersey City is don't start none. (laughs) There won't be none. (laughs) But I also thought to myself, I'm new here. And my parents taught me well to represent myself very well. And I knew on an instinctive level that I wasn't just representing myself at Drew University. I was representing my family. I was representing my community, whether I thought so or not, whether it's fair or not. I was representing my race. I was representing my socioeconomic class. All of these weights placed upon me that instinctively I knew I had. So I said, I'm going to cool out. And just continue to bask in the glow and the smell of the glistening meats and the glasses of milk and the quiche. But this was not enough for the two students who were seated not 50 feet from me. At one point, the young man turns to me and says, excuse me. We were just wondering. Where are you from? 
Before I answered what I knew was a very loaded question, when someone asks me where I'm from, typically they're not just asking, what city or town were you born in? They're asking, where are your people from? How long have you been in this nation? What is your provenance? And also, hidden subtly within their question was, uh, what is your pedigree? How much money do you come from? Are your parents college educated? All of this was hidden within their question. Before I could answer, the young man said, I'm sorry, you might be the under the impression that we were laughing at you. I said, okay, by making that statement, you remove all doubt that in fact you were laughing at me. And I said to myself, let's see how this is going to go down. The young man said, Jersey City, you say? And at that, the two break into full-bodied laughter. Laughter that clearly contained contempt and derision in the subtext. And I said, okay. He said, you see, Jersey City is the armpit of New Jersey. That's the impression I had as well. Mm, okay. He said, I'm sorry. And each time he said, I'm sorry, I knew that he wasn't sorry. It's just a very polite way to make a point. I knew I was among sophistication. Typically, when people would insult me in Jersey City, they would insult me openly. This was hidden. There was subterfuge, sophistication involved. And he said, you see, funny thing, my companion and I, just this weekend, were watching a show on television called Cops. You might have heard of it. You know, bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? I said, okay. He said, and funny thing, just this weekend, that show Cops featured Jersey City. I remained silent. At this point, the young woman, who hadn't said a word but contributed with her laughter, her tacit approval of what her companion was saying, she spoke up. Now, she didn't deign me worthy of addressing me directly. So instead, she directed her comments to her companion, which is almost worse. When someone is speaking about you in your presence and not speaking to you as though you were not there. And she said, you shouldn't laugh at him, you know. That was probably his uncle getting arrested on the show. Nothing in my academic training at public school 39 or at academic high school, not all of the hard skills that I had acquired that enabled me to get to Drew University and to flourish there in my classrooms, nothing had prepared me to contend with that. I'd like to tell you that the story I just told you was made up or exaggerated for effect. Unfortunately, it wasn't. I'd like to tell you that the effect of those statements that were hate-filled, very deliberate and intentional, rolled off my back like water off the proverbial duck. They did not. They had their intended effect. Those students presented themselves as the unofficial welcoming committee of Drew University. And not just Drew University, but upper middle class places of learning where people like me from places like Jersey City or Irvington or Newark or Detroit or Chicago or South Central Los Angeles are out of place. Where people like me who weren't dressed like them because perhaps I couldn't afford the clothes that they had. People like me with last names like Nunez or Santiago or Muhammad don't necessarily typically belong. They were letting me know that students like me did not belong there. The effect of their statements and that interaction stayed with me. It stung. And it began to make me question, do I belong here? What I'm going to contend to you today in the time that we have remaining, that in addition to all the hard skills that educators prepare children from urban contexts to have 
the ability to analyze complex information, the ability to think creatively, the ability and confidence to speak up in class and contribute to class participations, which is such a crucial component of success at the undergraduate and certainly the graduate level. All of those hard skills that we prepare our students with are necessary but insufficient because they must be buttressed. They must be supplemented by a set of soft skills, a set of psychological competencies that will allow our students not just to get to colleges and universities, but to flourish once they're there. And that will protect them and steal them against the assaults that will come sometimes on a regular basis, sometimes inadvertently, but sometimes quite deliberately and intentionally from students who say, you don't, in fact, belong here. 